600,000, that's before you get to illegal immigration. What are your concerns about this level of migration into the country from a security point of view? Uh, it's destabilizing socially. It's destabilizing politically. It allows people who have, let's say, criminal backgrounds, it allows potential terrorists into the country. I mean, there are so many knock-ons and concerns from having you know, large waves of immigration. But would that uh, include the, the legal, the legal m migration to this country, or would you focus exclusively on the small boats crisis? Or is well, it I think I would focus across, across I, I mean, look, the piece. There's an element of migration which is healthy for the economy. We all know that and we all understand that. I think it's the people trafficking, it's the illegal. And I mean, a lot of the people claiming to be refugees, they're economic migrants. And, uh, you know, it's very hard to absorb them in the numbers that they're coming in. They're coming in too fast, too many. And it has a heavy political downside. Look at the effect it has on our politics on a daily basis. I know that you're concerned, as, as most people are, most of my viewers and listeners, about preserving and protecting the environment. But you've been slightly sceptical in some aspects of the debate around climate change. So climate hysteria, gender ideology, critical race theory, all features of what's called woke ideology. Are these radical ideas a threat to this country? I think they're, to someone of my age, they're of deep concern. Um, I mean, zero carbon is a, certainly an objective that we all embrace, but a practical policy to zero carbon is something that deeply concerns me. And it seems that some of the, as it were, deadlines being put in place by the government are completely impractical. Well, if we they're, not gonna, they're, not, they're not gonna work. If we bankrupt ourselves for net zero whilst China burn fossil fuels for fun, that is a national security oh, issue, isn't it? Yeah, sure. Because and I, I mean, you know, at the moment we export a lot of our uh, carbon to China mm. or, you know, for manufacturing. Uh, and they are encouraging us to invest in renewables when renewables, quite frankly, uh, are still a relatively small part of our energy system and are not growing at the speed that some people think. They are largely uneconomic. Look what happened in the last uh, auction for, you know, building wind, uh, new wind farms. Right. No, no investment. No investment, no takers, because they're too expensive. We need a practical, pragmatic policy that works and I you know I think at the moment we're in a zone where we're looking at we're, look, we're looking at uh, policies which are based on ideology not good sense. Quick one on the Iraq war was Alistair Campbell's sexed up dossier and the failure to unearth those famed weapons of mass destruction damaging to the reputation of British intelligence? Uh, of course it was but I wouldn't put all the blame on Alistair's shoulders. It's, look, it's a really complicated issue. And, you know, the Chilcot Inquiry has written a report that's longer than the Bible trying to get to the bottom of it. And in my view, it still doesn't answer satisfactorily a lot of the questions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you wanted me to debate it, we need to debate an hour's programme to it, I think. <clears throat> Speaking of an hour's programme's worth of material, how do you solve a problem like Vladimir Putin? Uh, at the moment, by supporting the Ukrainians militarily with armaments to the hilt and not, as it were, weakening in our resolve to see Ukraine regain its lost territory. Yes, I think, uh, I think you're hopeful of a revolution in Moscow. That would probably be the swiftest solution. Well, I think, it? I think Putin's position is probably fragile. We've just yeah. seen that with what happened to Prigozhin. Um, <clears throat> to right. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, the UK and Brexit, global Britain, and the implications for our security? Uh, I'm an optimist. Mm. I think that our, as it were, re-established independence in the making of foreign and defence policy, the development of an alliance like AUKUS with Australia and the United States, these are big practical steps which put us... And, and I mean, let's face it, Brussels is not really very competent at doing geopolitics. So I think to be liberated from Brussels' inability to take unified decisions on big international policy issues 
is a big plus for Brexit. Well, speaking of geopolitics, let me tell you that Sir Richard Dearlove is the presenter, the co-presenter of One Decision. It's a podcast with 150,000 listeners as we speak. One Decision. Do check it out. And Sir Richard, thank you so much for your valuable time. Lots more to come. I'll be dealing with...